Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking About Birds, the only Cardinal podcast more surprising than Tommy Edmond hitting cleanup for the Dodgers. My name is Nate Heininger, and I am joined this week by my co-host, Ben Saborka. Surprise is not the emotion I would use, but uh, <laughs> yeah, shout out. Let's go. This week's opening bit comes to us via text message from Greg J. Greg J says, love your show. Listen to it every week. Thanks, Greg. If Thanks, you have Greg. a idea for the opening bit, uh, text or leave us a voicemail at 848-48-BIRDS. So, <laughs> thanks again, Greg J. Uh, Hambone, we are, we're, we're near the end of the spooky season. How you feeling? Oh, I'm, I'm at an all-time <laughs> level of spook today, Nathan. <laughs> So you, you're a big movie guy. We talk about movies yep. a fair bit on this show. Yep. What's your favorite horror movie? Whoa, that's, that's, wow. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. I, I will say, I, I can't answer that just like with a direct sure. statement. Wow. I will say my favorite, like contemporary horror movie. No, I'm a go. huge fan of Robert Eggers, the witch. Yeah. Um, which, which, the uh, witch. The Vavitch. Uh, I just think it's fantastic. It's super dark. It's super depressing. It's very well acted. Dost thou it's a little like strange. the taste of butter? What? Dost thou like the taste of oh, butter? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen this movie. I have seen this movie. Oh, that's that's very good. Thank you. Um, and that movie, it's, it's like an actual good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like it's, it's just well organized and, and, and directed and put together and everything like that. But I like them all. Like, like we were talking about Terrifier the other day. Yeah. I, I love those movies. And those movies, like the first two are barely movies. Um, the third one is much more of like a, there's like a structure and there's like, they shoot it mm. and light it properly and everything like that. Um, Going back all time, I think The Exorcist, the original Exorcist, yeah. is a fantastic movie and still spooky. I also really like that book. Um, the Thing, yeah, is great. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I'm racking my brain right now, but I uh, I like a zombie movie. Train to Busan is a lot of fun. I don't know if that's a horror movie. Horror movie, it's kind of actiony. Yeah, I think but, zombie uh, movies fit. Like they're almost always an action movie as well. Yeah, but it it. I think they they're fine to fit in the category, but I would say like my my heart is like the the splatter gore. I love the I love the we're going to chainsaw this we're like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We're going to rip this person limb from limb, and it you know it, it always cuts to a woman who's screaming, mouth wide open, and blood splatters all across her face <laughs> and her you? mouth and all that. <laughs> <laughs> I just like you know it's it's escapism. Um, you just get I, to you live know, out like what you want the world to be like via yes. film. Yeah. I'm pro purge. Uh -huh. Um, and I'd like to say that on this podcast yeah. right now, yeah. uh, you know, the first purge <laughs> is pretty good. Set them up and knock them down. Um, um, yeah. Oh, you know, one more out 28 days later. I actually just recently rewatched that one again. And I, I, that movie rips. I love that movie. Yeah. I've been wanting to rewatch that. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I watched misery. The other day. Yeah. It, you know, it depends on how you want to classify these things. It's a Stephen King novel. It, yeah. It's almost more like suspense and like. I would call it a thriller if, if I had to. Yeah. Um, like categorize that movie. It does basically have exactly what you're talking about, though, which is a woman screaming and blood being splattered all over. So it's a classic of the genre. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd never seen it before and I absolutely loved it. Like that's yeah. kind of my scene i really like the like high drama the whole situation is terrible uh, but right. generally speaking once we get into the like this is where you and i are very different once it's like my i'm like the first half of every horror movie i love and it's always the second half when it just goes you mean with like a nice happy family just enjoying their time <laughs> yeah I just i want to just see people having a chill no like the suspense of like what's gonna happen what's behind that door I, i've said this yeah. before barbarian 
like the first half of Barbarian, really the first like 75% of Barbarian is is one of my favorite horror movies. And then the last 25%, I was just like, all right, I'm, I don't want to spoil it too much for anyone, but like, I just... It's essentially two movies in one and then they blend into each other yeah. Is, is, yeah, what Dave just described. Yeah. But I, I really like it. You don't. That's fine. well. Ag- again, like the first seventy five percent of it, where it's like this really interesting, complex story and like a horrifying scenario and just like a people issue as well. I totally love. But when it just turns into someone's running around screaming, getting chased by stuff, I'm like, eh, kind of, kind of check out. Um, but I do love the thing. So, and I always say my favorite horror movie is The Shining, which. I, you know, has its fair bit of blood, but it is more that sort of like, um, suspense and well, it's always, what is Jack going to do? Which is scary because yeah. you're not sure how connected he is and what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I like that too. I like, you know, and I, and I think like a good horror movie kind of blends all of these mm-hmm. different things. Like house of a thousand corpses, I think is a great example of a movie that is over the top splatter gore, violent, it has a ton of tension building. There are the people issues. And then it kind of just devolves into this like bloody, horrifying mess towards the end. And I think a good horror movie should have all those elements. Um, but I also I, you know, I, I I consume a lot of them. So like it's all good, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Like The Exorcist, there's like a couple of scenes in that movie that are quote unquote horrifying, but just the little girl coming down the stairs and saying, you're going to die up there to the astronaut like that made it hard for me to sleep when I was a younger boy. It's just it's so good. I love it. Uh, have you seen The Last es- Exorcism? Um, there are so many exorcism movies. I don't know. This one is not really affiliated with the the core exorcist franchise. It is set up as a mockumentary of a guy who oh, does. No, I, I have not seen that. Okay. No. It's a guy who does fake exorcisms for profit. Um, and you know, it's a horror movie. So he finds himself a bit over his head. Uh, as yeah. it turns out, maybe a real exorcism might've been needed oh, in this situation. And that sounds fun. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's really, really cool. Um, I'll recommend one movie. If you're a total freak, if you're like, man, everything that Ben is saying, that's, that's the vibe that I like to be on. Um, let me recommend to only those people, the house that Jack built. It is a, uh, it's a very long, slow movie about a serial killer, um, kind of making his case at the gates of hell of why he shouldn't be, um, in the ninth circle Hmm. and going through, uh, various events in his life i'll just yeah i don't, I don't want to talk about it actually let's just move on. <laughs> do, I don't okay i'll do one last rec and then we can go yeah. we got a lot of cardinal news actually uh surprisingly they kind of all dropped in the last like 24 hours so we'll get into that quickly but uh have you seen late night with the devil no it is on my hard drive it is okay. it is it is it will be watched by me soon yeah i i absolutely loved this film it's set in sort of a uh 70s talk show thing um where a guy is uh hosting a show and he's bringing on guests and he's trying to do like a spooktacular you know evening late night talk show thing and it goes off the rails from there i'll tell you what hambone uh but i I totally loved it uh so yeah uh it's a you might have some of you might have heard of it too because it's a movie that got in a little trouble a few years ago because it used ai art in some of its uh, like interstitial stuff and they handled it pretty well. They actually, they kind of did it before people started to recognize like the implications of AI, AI art. And there was sort of the backlash against AI art. So they've come out and talked about it and whatnot. And it's pretty minor in the movie, but I only bring it up to say some of you might've heard about this movie through that lens. Um, and it may what have a- put, put you off of it, but it's, <laughs> it's an incredible film. What a niche, 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 point of view you had right there um <laughs> yeah T- tweet at us if th- what nate just said to you has ever come up to you tweet at us i'd be very curious uh well but i think you need to plug into the zeitgeist a little bit more <laughs> wow that is <laughs> so fucked up that you would talk to me like that read a book um <laughs> yeah i will thank you <laughs> okay uh the Cardinals heim bloom 
has made some decisions and we are wow. starting to see the organi organization um, be repopulated and staffed, uh, which is really interesting. We haven't really gotten anything like this for quite a long time. And it's really kind of fun to see, to start to see um, one, like the direction that Heim Bloom intends to go and two, just what it's like when you have an organization that is capable and willing to hire outside of uh, the yeah. Cardinals organization with one key exception, which is hilarious, well, which we'll talk yeah. about. But, um, you know, we had a number of these coaching decisions and front office decisions um, be decided. Um, so we thought we'd kind of go through them and, and talk about them. What we do know, uh, a lot of this is recent, and I won't pretend to be expert on all of these guys and the various levels of different organizations outside of the Cardinals, but we can talk about what we do know. Um, so, Hambone, do you want to run us down some of yep. these hires? Well, I, I think we should just sit and, and talk about the the big, not the biggest move yet, but the most noteworthy new, news as far uh, move as far as like name recognition, uh, and that is that the Cardinals have announced that uh, the hiring of John Jay, <laughs> AKA chief justice, uh -huh. um, to be their new, uh, a new coach on the staff. And that also means that Willie McGee is going to go up to the front office. He will no longer be a field, uh, uh person. He will be a special assistant to John Mosellock. Mm -hmm. Um, now my guess is that that's going to be some special assistanting to John Mosellock and some roving instructor type roles in throughout the minor leagues at spring training. Because when you have a resource like Willie McGee, like he should be talking to players. Yeah. And that's just my guess on how they will handle that situation. Um, but, you know, the headline of the news, John Jay. He's back. Coming back. Uh, obviously, we talked about the Marlins completely decimated their mm -hmm. coaching staff. They're like, I, I think even clubbies were getting fired. They just like killed the whole thing. Talk about so, a bloodbath. Talk about a bloodbath. That's that's Spooktober wow. right there. Um, but John Jay, we all know him. We all love him. Cardinal great. Bringing that uh, booty power fielder. back to St. Louis. Booty power. Good eye. He is, he's coming back home. So it's going to be him, Dirty Dan, and uh, and Ali Marmol kind of just running it back, which is, you know, kind of cute, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I get it is. It's funny because we've been talking all about like we need new, we need new, we need new. And then now the, the only high, the only current hires that we know about in the dugout are all Cardinal insiders like former Cardinals. It's cool. Right. John Jay just spent time. He's been quite a while in different organizations. So he has certainly learned. Um, so it's not straight like the pipeline, like a Marmol who spent the right. entire career in St. Louis. And by all accounts, John Jay um, has done pretty well outside at these other organizations. There was a brief moment where I was reading that the Marlins were considering holding on to John Jay and actually making him even more of an important part of that organization. Uh, you know, they clearly decided not to do that, uh, but I'm excited about it. I think if there's ever a place to have like a former, you know, player, a former star, at least for the team, it's in the dugout as a coaching uh, member of the coaching staff like this. Uh, so I'm here for it. And I'll say, you know, to you know, we obviously criticize the Cardinals for being insular and, and doing this over and over again. Um, John Jay comes back from the good old days mm -hmm. when the Cardinals were a well-run organization that was developing talent. It was finding people like himself, developing them nicely and having them take over key roles for championship winning clubs. Um, so maybe he remembers the old days and maybe he can kind of bring some of that old flavor back to the club. Like, you know, this is clearly a very positive outlook on this, but may maybe that's part of the thought. And also I, I think like you were, getting at he's just a smart person who's good at his job so that's you yeah know, he happened to work here before yeah yeah so i'm here for it um you know there's world series champion yeah we should have started with that world series champion john jay is coming back under the wings of the cardinals wow wow it's the, the memphis mafia is uh, they're all coming back to uh to run the dugout i guess um yeah i mean if you had to predict right now who is the next Cardinal from that era to come back to the team as a coach? Ooh, uh, interesting question. What's for call doing right now? Where's he at for call? I don't know. That guy, I, hopefully he's just relaxing because he had a great career and made a shitload of money. Yeah. So hopefully he's just chilling, but like, 
I, I think it's more like the Alan Craig level of player. Yeah. Rafa Furcal was like a, a all star. Yeah. Uh, well, Craig like, is. You know, I think he's in the Padres, but he seems to be going like front office type work. Yeah. Um, so in the dugout, I don't know. I mean, he was only here for a little bit of time, but like, I bet Ryan Terrio is a is a coach somewhere right now, right? He's yeah. that exact uh, mold. Well, Matt Holiday was almost a coach. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, someday I hope to get more clarity on on that whole thing. I mean, it might have just been what they said, um, but it certainly at the time felt like there was a bigger story here. And I, I don't know. Um, he saw the writing on the wall, I think. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Um, and I'm also going to throw out there. Um, what about like Shane Robinson? Remember Shane Robinson? The rally squirrel himself. Yeah, I remember Sugar Shane, Shane Robinson. Yeah. Sugar Shane, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe he'll come back. Now we're just naming names from the 2011 World Series Cardinals. Here's I got another one for you, Nate. You're going to love this one. Yeah. Pete Cosma. <laughs> Here. Did that, did that hit? Oh, uh, man. Has there been a Cardinal more like despised at least online than Pete Cosma in the last 15 years. Uh, Ty Wigington, but it was very brief. Yeah. That doesn't count. Cause Wigington, they, they were pretty quick to pull the cord on that one. If you remember, I think it was back on our old show on talking about birds point, uh, 1.0, we were trying to raise money, uh, to counter the Ty Wigington <laughs> signing so that the Cardinals could just eat the cost. <laughs> well, it was like two years, 5 million, and even at that, he got cut at like two months into the into the contract. Yeah, he sucked. Yeah. Um, all right. So John Jay is going to be in the dugout. Willie McGee no longer in the dugout. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. The Cardinals also announced that they have hired Brant Brown as their new hitting coach. Uh, Brown is 53 years old, played in the majors from 1996 to 2000. He then pivoted to coaching, starting with gigs in the minors. Uh, he was hired by the Dodgers in 2018 as was on that club staff through 2022 uh, first as the assistant hitting coach and then as the hitting strategist uh, he then in 2023 uh, went to the Marlins as a hitting coach and jumped to the Mar- with uh, to the Mariners in 2024 and he was fired uh, shortly after that uh, as we talked about um, the uh, uh, so yeah I don't know really what to say about Brant Brown other than some really good GMs have hired him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by that, I mean the Dodgers, oh, the Dodgers just organization, obviously well run, uh, you know, say what you want about Kim Ng. I thought she was good. Uh, and then she got fired as did this guy. Um, and then he went to go work for Jerry DePoto. So just like looking at pedigree, looking at who's hired him. Um, I think that this is a good sign. I don't think you can fully blame the Marlins and Mariners anemic a- offense on him at all uh, because I don't think any level of coaching would have helped those two teams. The, the Marlins um, don't really have a major league roster and the Mariners, I don't know what to say about the Mariners, but I, I don't think it's Brant Brown's fault. No, is, I guess what the I'm Mariners, I mean, that is, that is uh, the worst hitting environment in baseball um, yeah. is their ballpark. Um Everybody struggles there. Everyone, you get the breakouts like a Julio, where it's like a guy who's going to crush anywhere in baseball. Um, but like, look at Tay Oscar. He went from uh, the Mariners to the Dodgers, and doesn't seem to have changed his profile too much. He's just crushing yeah. at Dodger Stadium versus playing in in, in Mariners. Uh, what's the name of their Safeco? Is it Safeco? Safeco. No, it's not Safeco. Oh, wait, no. Safeco was like a thousand years ago. It's T-Mobile. T-Mobile. <laughs> okay. um, so I don't know. It is hard to hold anyone accountable, especially a hitting coach like this. He was there for a half a season or something like that. Right. So right, yeah, um, the Mariners, uh, I really like the Mariners, but they, they are just constantly, well, in a lot of ways, they have felt like the Cardinals for the last few years where, um, expectations are higher, but they just keep failing them. Um, so I, I'm overall pretty excited about the hire. Again, like you said, the pedigree, um, I'm just excited to get an outside voice. 
I'm in my trust Heim Bloom, uh, you know, season. So I'm just willing to to roll with this, and uh, I guess we'll see what see what he does. Yeah, uh, just to illustrate your point, um, it is uh, T-Mobile Park is the worst place to hit in the big leagues. Uh, to give you a point of reference, Bush Stadium's park factor is an even 100. Uh, the Rockies Coors Field, my home, is 112. And uh, this, the park factor ratings and the Seattle Mariners T-Mobile Park is a 91. Yeah. Um, why, why Why don't they just bring in the the walls? What do they, I didn't realize it was that that crazy. The next closest is 96. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've assumed away. I mean, part of it is that the Mariners also have had an incredible pitching staff for quite a while now. And so I, part of me thinks that's been sort of opposite Yankees where, you know, they, they build their team to, um, to fit that, what their ballpark does, you know, they're like, we have a hard yeah. to hit one, uh, a ballpark that's hard to hit in. Let's lean into pitching and we can just completely crush. And it kind of works. Their pitching has been incredible, but it turns out you also have to score some runs to win games, and they just yeah. continuously struggle to put together a good offensive team. Yeah. Um, the Yankees' uh, ballpark has an even 100 ball, uh, ballpark factor, just like the Cardinals, but they do have a 119 home run factor. Um, so I think it's harder to hit extra base hits there, but it's easy to hit it over the wall. Um, yeah, it's I was just kind of um, curious about that. There was something where it was like if Bobby Witt played at, at Yankee Stadium, he'd hit like 13 more home runs this year or something like that. I, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but their their stadium is particularly set up for home runs. Um, Gosh darn. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, he's coming down. Uh, some other news. I think this is probably the most... Uh, probably the most uh, impactful signing of this uh, week, a fellow named Robert Serfolio. Serfolio. Let's get used That's to a- saying and hearing this name. Serfolio. Um, Cornholio <clears throat> uh, has been hired as an assistant GM, player development and performance. Uh, or sorry, with a focus on player development and performance. Sir Folio was previously with the Guardians as director of player development, uh, and he was hired by the Guardians back in 2015. This I like, Nathan. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend to know who Robert Sofolio was. Uh, I am going to call him Cornholio going forward. Mature. But what are the Guardians good at? What have the Guardians been good at for 2015 up until now? Um, TP and what are for the, the bunghole? <sighs> wow. You started this. What do you want from I me? I guess I did. <laughs> um, and you know what? I'm going to say thank you for picking me up, bro. <laughs> what a, was, What else do you want from me if not to say that at that I'm moment? I'm being genuine. I thought that that was actually super cool. Good. I feel like you actually had my back. Yeah, I got you, baby. Um, that was... Oh, no. Now I don't like it. Wink. <laughs> I'm not a baby. I'm a man. <laughs> uh, yes. So... The, the Guardians are known pretty much explicitly for their player development. And the Cardinals yeah. have now hired their former head of player development. Uh, how, do, how do you do that? How do you just like, if this guy was just out there, is this the Heim Bloom effect? Is this what, like, that guy's just there. He comes over here. I mean, I, I'm sure there was money involved, obviously. Um, but like, I don't... He's just here now. It's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have this to. Is a huge win. I would have to imagine it, the argument is the same thing we saw with, um, uh, like Friedman going to the Dodgers and things like that, where it's like, we want you to do what you have been doing, but we're going to give you more resources than what you've yeah. been getting at the Guardians, because the Guardians have been pretty low in payroll and just overall spend. And they've been a consistently productive. I mean, we just saw them. They just lost in the ALCS on yeah. a team um, pretty much exclusively homegrown. Um, I'm struggling to think of any key piece that was not either uh, home, homegrown or acquired via trade. Um, you're really oh, acquired via trade. I was going to say you're really discounting Lane Thomas right now. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you're right. I, and I didn't know this, that they traded for, uh, Josh Naylor way back in the yeah. day. Um, was he a Red Sox? Uh, he was a Marlin. Okay. Um, they also traded for Manzardo, who was an upcoming prospect, 
prospect, um, who I think will be very good very soon. Andre Jimenez, obviously we remember that trade when they moved on from Frankie Lindor and got uh, him from the Mets. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, their, their pitching is mostly homegrown. Um, their offensive play or their, uh, position players are mostly homegrown. And I think more importantly than anything is that they clearly have an ability to take a pitcher whose stuff might not be popping off the page and develop them into a Tanner Bibby, into a, uh, a Tristan McKenzie, a Shane Bieber. Mm-hmm. Like these guys were not highly, highly regarded, uh, I guess maybe other than Tristan McKenzie, uh, coming out of the draft, and they have just shown this ability to create pitchers out of nowhere, yeah, over and over and over again. I, what I was reading is that they typically prioritize high command guys that they believe they can add velocity and stuff to. Um, so I think we can anticipate probably a repeat of that. And from an offensive profile, they tend to prefer. Uh, high hit tool guys that they believe they can add power to after the fact. Um, I mean, look no further than Jose Ramirez. Uh, obviously, that is extreme. Ex- you know, I, I believe that he is likely a Hall of Famer. So I agree. I'm not necessarily saying we should be looking for the next Jose Ramirez, but it's, I mean, we should. we should be, hopefully. But that's the profile, right? A guy yeah. who can hit the ball well and hit it hard, and as he gets older, will um, add muscle and add power. Um, and so what? Those both of those uh, approaches make sense. You will see other teams maybe prioritize power first and hope they can add hit tool later. Um, you know, both can be successful. Um, I guess ultimately I'm glad to see an approach that they have done consistently that has resulted in consistent success. Um, and. I don't like if you asked me what has been the Cardinals approach to the draft and um, player selection. I think we could talk about the various different things that that has looked like over the over the years, but um, hasn't really been a very consistent approach for a while. Despite there have been some obviously some hits, especially over the last few years. Still, if you had to ask me what is their core methodology, I would struggle to give you a, a clear answer. Um, so I'm interested to see, does, um, Sir Folio come over and just repeat his methodology that's been successful now with a, a, a team with more resources, or are they going to sort of blend in with, you know, I'm assuming Heim Bloom is going to have his finger on this to some degree. Um, uh, at the end of the day, I'm excited for this, this, uh, uh, bringing in someone with this track record. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, well, uh, yeah. And, and just outside the organization. Um, it's all, it's all good news. Um, in addition to Mr. Cornholio coming over, Matt Slater, a special assistant to the GM, uh, for player procurement is stepping down from his position to pursue other opportunities in baseball. Uh, and then I'd like to read something that Derek Gould wrote about this, uh, about Slater specifically earlier this week. He said the Slater has been with the club since 2007, served as its director of player personnel for seven years, and has been heavily involved in expanding the Cardinals' eye for talent, such as strengthening their presence in Japan and Korea. He uh, had a role in pursuing All-Stars Aled Mies Diaz and Miles Michaelis, as well as Sung Hwan Oh, Randy Rosarena, Adolis Garcia, Quang Hyun Kim, and since 2011 has also been part of scouting for top draft picks, including Waka and Wong teams, such as the Phillies and Tigers considered him for past GM searches. Um, so, you know, as these moves happen, of course, some brain drain is going to happen. I don't know if this is going to be a good move or a bad move. Obviously Derek Gould put a really rosy colored outlook on that. There are obviously some all-stars, um, and some players who turned out to be really good, like Rosa Reina and, and Garcia. Diaz I is still, still in the league, too. Sorry? Aledmans Diaz is still in the he league. He is. Elite bat ball, Nate. Yeah. Elite. Wow. Elite. We always call bat-to-ball. him Chachi, because he kind of looks like Chachi. He kind of does. That haircut. <laughs> you prefer, he could buy a better haircut. Um, and I kind of am of the opinion that Kwang Hun Kim never got a full shake in the big leagues with 2020 being the way it was. And, and just, I don't know. I I felt like there was more in the tank there, but all all that being said, the guy's been with the club since 2007. I was still in high school. 
Um, I think it's a good idea to move on from a guy who has been there that long. And it seems as though he has been kind of part of, um, of, of this front office group going stale and, and, and getting complacent. So yeah, yeah. it can be mutually beneficial. I'm sure that he's well liked in the, in the front office, he's been around there forever and has had a big impact, but I'm sure he's looking around, seeing all this change, all these new guys coming in, probably a lot of excitement about the new guys. And you just Yale guys with their blackberries. Yeah. You just don't want to be that guy who's like, ah, you know, I've been here forever and, and it's time to move on, especially if he'd been considered for GM roles at other teams. I'm sure he'll be able to, uh, walk out and, and walk into another front office somewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of back to the Serfolio and, and the Heim Bloom and, and just all these changes. I have to imagine that even though the Cardinals are on, you know, hard times at the moment, that the prospect of being part of the group to revamp and turn around a legendary franchise, you know, the second most World Series winning franchise and a, a fan base like like the Cardinals have when they're not a total bag of steaming dog shit. Um, is exciting. And, and I, I guess it makes sense to me when, through that lens that talent would want to come here. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and I kind of meant to say that earlier too, obviously Servolio, I'm sure there's a money and there's a resources thing and all that, but yeah, I mean, there is a prestige element and you can see that too, where, uh, I think that these guys, they're competitive. They're in sports. They are competitive. They've had to like the front offices kind of work in the same way that the, the the game does you have to work your way up to the top you are a, a competitive person very likely and you see these high end organizations these high these like you said you know legendary franchise you want to be the one who brings it back to uh to relevancy i think you know there was all that talk about uh, with the cubs like who whoever is the one who does it for the cubs they're going to be you know inked in uh chicago history forever um obviously that's a very the the scale of their uh you know failure is in, was enormous and and unlike anything we've ever seen Nathan. yeah so th- it's not comparative really but the idea is the same you've built up a track record somewhere else and now you can go in and, and be part of this like savior of this new of this famous organization and um You know, it's kind of a cliche at this point, but it is true. Like Bush Stadium, the fans will support. It doesn't have to be the best product. They just have to be competitive. And that stadium is going to sell out, uh, you know, most of the time. So I I would like if I was just entering into baseball and I'm trying to be unbiased here. If you ask me what I rather work for the Cardinals or the Guardians, I would do the Cardinals 100 percent of the time even though I have a lot of respect for the guardians and their history as well. It's just a bigger franchise. Right. Uh, and bigger payroll. Yeah. Uh, bigger resources. And I think the promise of all this change is probably exciting. Uh, bloom is expected to bring on dozens of new employees as part of his multi-year plan to restore the Cardinals farm system. So this is truly just the beginning. We're taught like the fact that we're talking multiple dozens, and I'm curious how many of these people are replacing other people. How many of them are just straight up new roles that are going to be coming in? Obviously we'll learn more and more as the off season continues. Um, but it is kind of wild to think it's just thinking about how bare bones, the Cardinals had gotten themselves into for the obvious reasons that we've already hit um, and what this organization is going to look like from a front office standpoint here, probably over the next few months, it's going to be night and day. Um, And then of course, you know, hopefully that aligns with the GM meetings, uh, the winter meetings. um, And, you know, we start having some fun. Yeah. I'm excited about it. It's kind of what we've been calling for uh, us as fans and other people in the, in the, like if you can talk or write about the Cardinals for the last five years, probably everyone at some point has lobbied for something like this. Um, and I'm I'm glad to see it's finally happening. This is everything that we've really asked for short of, and I've never gone this far, but some people have also wanted like the full sell-off as well. You know, trade everybody, do the full yeah. rebuild uh, from a player standpoint. I'm not as gung-ho about that. We've talked about that if, over the last few weeks on who you retain and who you move on from but in every other way 
this is essentially a an organizational rebuild. Yeah, and I, I understand where people are coming from by saying that and, and just totally hitting the reset button. But you do not want to watch that team and trading away players like uh, Nolan Gorman or Lars Nupar, Brendan Donovan. Um, it, it's not. It's not going to be good. You have them. The, the control. There's so much control still. They're good. Most of those guys I just said are good right now. Um, why don't those be the old veterans while your young team, your young team is up and coming? Um, I just totally disagree with that premise. So shut up and 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 you know <laughs> be away from, with from me uh, with that talk. Unless you're doing um, like a, an interesting package to convert some of those resources into similarly valuable young pitching, um, which is more of like a, a roster balance thing. But if you're just dumping them for a bunch of like single A lottery tickets or something like that, then yeah, then yeah, get out of here. Yeah, I guess if you can convert Lars Newbar and Nolan Gorman into. Uh, one of those Seattle pitchers or, or something like that, or, or some crazy prospect I'm not thinking of right now. Yeah. But the whole resale, I just, there's too much young talent on this team for that to make sense. Uh, you look no further than uh, Burleson and Wynn and Donovan and, and Newt. Like those alone, you can, you can build, mm-hmm. you could start something with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, they won 83 games in uh, 2024 which we know they kind of got on the lucky side of things, but um, it was still, to be fair to the team, it was still an above 500 team and ultimately a handful of games out of the playoffs. So, yeah, I think if you run it back in 25, they would it would be a worse outcome than that. But point being, it's not like this team just lost 60 games or, right. or, or won 60 games and has no real talent like the White Sox should trade Luis uh, Robert Jr. because he's a star on a team full of trash. They should trade uh, any of their successful players because they need everything rebuilt. The Cardinals are not there. The Cardinals yeah. have a ton of or a fair amount of currently valuable MLB level players. Yeah, I really if if I'm just thinking around the league right now, I think the White Sox the Rockies and the Marlins are the only teams that I am thinking like, yeah, you should completely burn it to the ground. Every other team has something you can work around. Even the A's, I think they have mm-hmm. some, some Brent Rookers and some Shay Langoliers and Mason Millers. There are pieces there. Yeah. They, like we, we shit a lot on the A's because of their organization, but them as a team, like if you're an A's fan and you can get over Ooh. all of the horribleness <laughs> It's kind of becoming a fun t- fun team to watch. You didn't mention Lawrence yeah. Butler. Total Lawrence breakout. Butler, yeah, he went off this year. Yeah, yeah, he looks like legit, you know, um full se- if he had a he was on a like f- almost 40-40 pace if he had played a full season. Uh yeah. so, you know, they've got some stuff there. Tyler Soderstrom looks like he might be a legit power bat too. They could be a fun team. I'm actually really curious. Uh this Sacramento ballpark usually uh, these minor league stadiums are very hitter friendly and uh, this team full of power, Geloff, Butler, Soderstrom, Langoliers, yeah. all these guys are now about to be hitting in a minor league ballpark for half the season. Uh, we might see some absolute bombs coming out of uh, the Sacramento athletics or whatever next year. Just the athletics is what they're calling themselves. Sure. Yeah, that is true. Man, oh man, I am. I'll talk about this later in the in the year. But I am just so annoyed that baseball is letting this happen. Yeah, um, but it is. Uh, all right, let's talk more about the Cardinals. Uh, the Cardinals did have some good news come out this week, uh, and that is they they have three Gold Glove nominees: uh, Nolan Arenado, Mason Wynn, and Brendan Donovan. All nominated for the Gold Glove. Brendan Donovan nominated for the Utility Gold Glove once again. Um, so pretty exciting. Yeah. It's super exciting to, uh, to see some Cardinals back on the list for, for gold glove nominee, uh, Arenado. Great. Um, he really came on in the second half. Uh, I'm be interested to see if he, if he wins it again. Um, but either way, it's fun to see him on the list. Um, and I, I don't know. I think win win is probably the favorite, right? And I'm hopeful that Donovan can win it again too. 
I think Wynn is the favorite. Uh, and I think Arenado could be the favorite. Um, he also, you know, like the name, of course, the fact that uh-huh. he's just like back in the mix. I think people will like that a lot after having a year off. That's like, you know, story and sure. uh, uh, narrative, all that shit. Uh, but he also had a really good year. So why wouldn't he? Um, you know, I think that that would be a lot of fun. Matt Chapman is in the National League right now, yeah. though. So that's another factor. Uh, but yeah, I think Mason Wynn, it would not surprise me at all. And I think just from like our standpoint, how fun is it? I thought that Mason Wynn was going to be a good shortstop. And I thought that he was going to hit. But he has eclipsed my, I think, everyone's expectations so quickly. Um, it's it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Gold gold glove likely in his first year. 15 bombs in his first year. Um, stolen bases. Hitting for average. And... I think more importantly, um, just the the consistency in the plate approach. Um, he it it just felt like he was almost immediately comfortable this year. Yeah, and he's a type of guy that you could trust in every at bat, and the underlying numbers back it up. And I don't think he's done growing. We've seen this at every level uh, for him. He just continues to get better at every level. Uh, the more time he spends there. Um, I was expecting this sort of production in like year two or three of him as a major league player. So the fact that he's already doing it gives me a ton of hype about what does a fully matured at the major league level Mason Wynn look like. Um, I mean, frankly, it's it, hopefully it's like somewhere in the 280, 290 batting average with 20 home runs, 20 stolen bases and a gold glove. Like, I mean, what more can you ask for? Uh, sign the kid, sign the kid Uh, eight years, 10 years, 12 years. Yeah. Give him the bag, keep him around, build the team around him. Yeah. Ozzy Smithify him, make him the dude. Yeah. They gave him number zero because it's the the closest he could get to Ozzy Smith's number is what he says. I think, I don't know if there's a more pressing need for the off season than to extend one of those types of type of guys. Yeah. Um, I would argue maybe like a trading Ryan Helsley sort of thing, but that's not that you could do that in the, uh, during the season. And, and yeah, I, I think you have to extend one of these young people. Yeah. Uh, we have not seen that type of behavior at all from the Cardinals for quite a while now. Um, so I'm interested to see what Heim Bloom's thought process on that is. And if he's going to make any effort this season. If you if you move Ryan Helsley's contract, if you move Sonny Gray's contract, um, and I don't know, you know, you're just le- losing Paul Goldschmidt's contract. That is the type of cash that you should be using to keep around good players. Yeah, I think, and maybe why they weren't doing that in the past. I don't know. We don't we haven't really gotten a straight answer than that. Other than Mosellock likes to say, "Oh, well, it takes two to tango, and they have to want to be here, and they have to let us screw them over on the <laughs> deal." Um, I don't know. I totally just changed my Mosellock impression. Hey, but. it's me. <laughs> 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 Dirtbag. That's what he deserves. <laughs> Get him out of here. Yeah. Well, hey, guys. Um, Go eat at Arby's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to see Mosellock in an Arby's commercial. If, uh, um, well, we have I, the meats. If ultim- ultimately, if you wanted us to extend our good players, you really should have bought three more. Uh, cheesy bacon <laughs> Arby's double sandwich. I don't know any um, Arby's names right now. Don't they do the five by five? You get five sandwiches for five bucks. Uh, roughly 18 years ago, they did that. So, oh, man, I don't know. I think right now it's probably five dollars a sandwich. Oh, the shrinkflation. Thanks a lot, Biden. Let's wow. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do have to issue a correction, yeah. um, which pains me i don't like doing this honestly i almost left it out of the outline entirely because i think it's bullshit that somebody would think that they could correct me um (laughs) but uh somebody did in the bird score i I believe it was c70 of course it was c70 (laughs) (laughs) alerted (laughs) us uh and i i erroneously stated last week that michael siani was ineligible for the gold glove uh because he did not hit the required innings According to some keen reporting by Katie Wu and tweeting by C70, that is not true. He did qualify 
Um, so we are currently living in Snub City. Wow. Well, first of all, apology accepted. Um, what? And second of all, yeah, Snub City indeed. Come on. Come what, on. Uh, what are you I, doing, MLB? It's compl- It's total bullshit. I don't understand. What, what does the man have to do? I'm guessing he suffers from the fact that a core part of the gold glove uh, process is that it is a bit of a popularity con contest and Siani while front and center for us as Cardinal fans this year um, was doing a ton of his best work when no one was watching the St. Louis Cardinals anymore. Yeah. Um, So he just, you know, he, he offensively, he was better than we expected. And he, you know, he was interesting. I think people used to say he didn't hit well enough to win a gold glove. Um, and unfortunately that is kind of how it works. You like, you have to get attention on you in one way, um, or you have to do it long enough as a defensive superstar to really get garner the attention. Um, and he just suffers from, you know, being a light hitting defensive superstar on a team that was not particularly interesting at the mainstream level. Yeah. Well, I don't like it, Nate, but it is what it is. Um, I mean, on the flip side though, I'm, I'm, I am a little surprised that Brendan Donovan got nominated. Um, I don't really think that that makes sense, but I like Brendan Donovan (laughs) and I like to celebrate my dude. So whatever. Yeah. Like I like it too. And he, he does have a more, flashy offensive profile we've seen the power start to develop um but still i am surprised he was nominated like i i know uh, and i've seen this online and i'm sure that people listening to this will disagree with me i think that brendan donovan played really well in left field for a second baseman yeah um but i don't think i think I think maybe we're a little used to bad outfield play right now or something like that, but people are saying that he's a great outfielder. He is not a great outfielder. Um, I don't think the eye test shows you that. The advanced analytics don't show you that. It should be noted that he is a above average second baseman and third baseman. I think he is a great on the dirt um, and, and probably just not a not good enough to be a shortstop, but he is a plus at uh, those other two positions, and I think he plays a fine first base. Um I'm not trying to hate on the guy. It's just not his job and it's just not what he's good at. But uh, I think he did a fine job for somebody playing out of position yeah. due to a necessity. Which is part of the point of this uh, gold glove, right? I mean, it right. is pretty incredible to be able to say I'm a plus second baseman, I'm a plus third baseman, and I'm a pretty good you know, at league average, maybe slightly above league average, depending on which metric you want to look at, yeah. um, left fielder. So that makes him an incredible utility defender that he can play all those positions and and do them at least average. So I think he's deserving of this nomination. I'm just a little surprised, um, you know, with his injuries and everything too. I'm not coming after Brendan Donovan. No. I'm just setting the record straight, Nathan. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah, he's fine. He's fine. Sure. Um, all right. Uh, I think that's all I got for uh, the Cardi Boys this week. All right. Well, we uh, we are heading into the 2024 World Series. So we're going to talk about that and some other news and notes from around the league. But before we do, we do want to remind our listeners that this show is supported on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Talking About Birds. If you've been enjoying the show, enjoying uh, it coming to you every week consistently, uh, consider joining the Patreon. Um, it's a great way to show your support support for the show directly and join our little community. Uh, patrons of any level get access to the private Discord server. It's called the Bird Discord. We talk about it a fair bit on this show at this point. You can correct me in real time when I say <laughs> stupid shit. Uh, well, I'm going to correct you right now in real time. They're not correcting us in real time when we say stupid shit. Uh, we have talked about live streaming this show at some point. So if we, I guess it's it's real time for them. They're listening to the podcast and saying, ooh, Ben said this stupid yeah. thing. I'm going to let him know right now. And Ben just sits and stares at the bird scored 24-7 waiting for interaction. So you can you can get to him immediately. Um, if Yeah, you, you say that like that's a bad thing. I think that makes me cool. If you have maybe said, if he has maybe said something 
uh, negative about one of your favorite players and that favorite player has moved on to another team and is absolutely crushing and uh, you want to rub it in on to him, like this is a great, great place to do that. Yeah, I want you to rub Tommy Edmund into me. <laughs> Uh, patreon.com slash talking about birds um we're bringing this show to you every single week even throughout the off season and if you've got friends out there that are sick of or they're done with 2024 they want to move on but they they're still big cardinal fans and they want to understand the changes that are happening to the organization maybe now's a good time to introduce them to the podcast podcasts still predominantly um, spread through word of mouth and um, we really appreciate anyone just talking it up a little bit, sharing it with their friends, family. Um, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. Gobble, Ooh. gobble. Wow. Wow. Yeah, use your mouth to spread this podcast, please. <laughs> just like Nate said. And, of course, you can leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. That helps as well. Hambone, uh, if people want to interact with us more outside of those channels, where can they find us? Yeah, you can use your fingers to spread this podcast as well by uh, going to Twitter, finding us at Talk About Birds. We're on Instagram at Talking About Birds. Uh, we got a TikTok. You can come look at us on TikTok. Uh, you can listen to this show on Spotify or YouTube if you like to do that kind of thing. Uh, you could also email us directly to, uh, or sorry, at talkaboutbirds at gmail.com. And of course, you can call us and leave a voicemail or send us a text message to 848-48-BIRDS. That's 848-482-4737. That's right. 848-48-BIRDS. All right. So we here we have it. Uh, Manfred's dream. <laughs> the Dodgers and the Yankees are in the yeah. World Series. I did see an interesting take on this that uh, I hadn't really thought about before, which is really just restating the fact that this is the you know the two biggest media markets, the two biggest teams in baseball, the two biggest stars in baseball. This is really like the premium matchup of you know AL versus NL in 2024. And uh, it's an interesting opportunity to really see what is the ceiling on MLB viewership right now. Popularity, yeah. yeah. Like, conceivably, this should be the most watched World Series in a long time, right? Yeah. Um, because even if you're not in LA or in New York, which are massive markets on their own, there are very compelling uh, storylines here across the yeah. board, and some of everyone's favorite players are on these teams. Yeah, um, and so it well, is like, like we can joke about you know, oh, it's Manfred's dream, like I just did. But the reality is, is like this is a showcase of the sport when you've got Juan Soto, Aaron Judge, Garrett Cole, Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, Freddie Freeman. I mean, the list goes on. It's like star-studded teams, some of the better personalities in baseball um, with someone like Mookie Betts. It's crazy that Mookie Betts is like fifth build <laughs> in this matchup, you know? Um, so it will be interesting to see what are the ratings, how much is this talked about, does this break through traditional baseball media at all? Um, I think part of that will be determined on whether it's a good series, like how long does this go, what are the games like, are there are a lot of dingers, things like that. Um, but I am interested to see just how popular this World Series is. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, it's Mary and I were talking about this last night. It's the two teams, uh, baseball hats that you see worn by people who don't care about baseball. Like, yeah, the Dodgers hats and Yankees hats are just like part of people's clothing. Like, I, I, bet you that there are people who have Dodgers and Yankees hats that don't even know who the Yankees and Dodgers are, or really know, know anything about them. Yeah. Uh, maybe they know that they, it is a team. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, they're the two biggest teams, the two biggest markets, some of the most spendy teams. And then of course all the players, but yeah, you'd have to imagine everything you just said, plus the Japanese share uh, with Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Shohei Otani. I imagine like 98% of Japan is going to be watching every pitch of this, of this entire series. Yeah. Yeah, I was in, I think I talked about it, at, it when I got back, but I was in uh, Singapore 
a couple months ago. And in the airport in Singapore, there was an MLB store. And I was super excited because I wanted to go in there and see what sort of like, oh man, I'm going to find some really interesting, you know, Asian market swag uh, for MLB. And it was almost exclusively Yankees, Dodgers, yeah. Red Sox, and surprisingly, Guardians. Um, there was a section for the Guardians, uh, but there was z- literally nothing for the St. Louis Cardinals yeah. or like the Rockies or anything like that. It was pretty much just three or four teams gear, and it was just the licensed gear. Right. So there was nothing really unique there. I didn't end up buying anything because I'd just be buying a like a Yankees jersey from there instead of you know here. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and I also, I was, uh, I worked for, at an international company and I was on a call with a guy the other day and he was wearing a Yankees hat and I was like, Oh, Yankees. Nice. You know, are you a fan? He goes, no, everyone just wears these here. Yeah. It's like, yeah, cool. That's just how big it is. Yeah. That's how like, it's just part of the, the culture at this point. Um, I, I am looking at these teams and it is funny that like Anthony Rizzo, who's a pretty big star in MLB is like. 10th or 12th build on, yeah. on the players that people will be excited to see. Um, I, I think it's going to be fun. I, I, the only issue that I have with it, especially living on the, the Western side of the United States is that Dodgers fans are just the most obnoxious <laughs> group of people. Um, and Yankees fans are, are, are right there too. And I know Cardinals fans are as well. Yeah. Uh, but when you have the two worst fan bases going against each other, my goodness, is it going to be annoying? Uh, but I, I am actually kind of looking forward to it. I'm really excited for you know Juan Soto and Aaron Judge to go up against Shohei Otani and Mookie Betts. That's just that's just good. Um, and if you're a baseball fan, you want to see the best players against the best players. Who are you picking, Nathan? I got to stick with who I've been saying from the beginning. I think we are opposite choices here. I'm still leaning Dodgers. I get yeah. it. And I'm not going to be surprised at all if it's Yankees. I think this is like a 51-49 sort of yeah. thing. Like this is a coin flip. If you played this series out a thousand times, I bet both win 480 of them. You know? Yeah. Um, but I just think the Dodgers, I think um, with Sho- Shohei, Freddie, Betts, uh, I mean, Yamamoto has been kind of up and down. I Yeah. But, I, I just, I think it's going to be the Dodgers. Yeah. I, I mean, I think like you said, it, it's pretty hard to pick one team or the other. I, I am going to go with the Yankees. That is my official pick. Um, and, and I think it really comes down to a, a couple of factors. The fact that Giancarlo Stanton is on fire he is right playing now. very well. And if that sticks around, that means you cannot, you that, that means you're screwed, right? You can, like what the Guardians were trying to do, and I thought it made sense, is they were picking their poison. They were either going to go against Juan Soto or Aaron Judge, and they mostly went with Aaron Judge um, walking Juan Soto. When John Carlos Stanton is going the way that he's going, you can't do that because yeah. then the, there's going to be at least one on. You're going up against John Carlos Stanton. Um, and of course, he has people like Jazz Chisholm and Anthony Rizzo and Anthony Volpe behind them. Like it, this team is really good. But really, for me, the the differentiating factor is Garrett Cole, uh, Garrett Cole, Carlos Rodon, and Clark Schmidt. I think Clark Schmidt is underrated. I think he's had a really nice playoffs, and I just think Garrett Cole is the best pitcher in baseball. And I think it's going to come out. I saw him pitch a game against the Guardians where he was just dotting ninety nine mile an hour fastballs on the corners. He he's he's the man, yeah. and I think. Uh, I just think it's going to go the distance. I mean, offensively, I think you can make an even stronger argument for the Dodgers. Obviously, the yeah. the, the peak of Judge and Soto back to back. I don't think you quite have that with the Dodgers, but uh, you have the, like Otani. I think is is the best hitter of all of them. Um, I mean, I guess he, you know, I, I don't know. All three of them, it, you kind of pick your yeah. poison there. I would say on any one single at bat, I would take Juan Soto over the rest of the world. Um, yeah, but like the power that Otani has, the power that Judge has, those cannot be matched. But I'm, for, it, it's a, it's you know, have the discussion however you want. If yeah. you just need one at bat to go well, I would go Juan Soto over the rest of the league. Um, but those boys be doinking dongs. <laughs> they you do know, be doinking dongs. That goes a long way. Well, and 
what you're explaining or what you were saying about Stanton was also the case with the Dodgers for uh, Teoscar Hernandez, who yeah. has been playing very well. So if you yeah. somehow get past Otani, Betts, and Freeman, you then have Teoscar Hernandez, uh, who has been absolutely crushing as well. Um, and then you've got Max Muncy and, and yeah. you know, all the people behind them. Too. Yeah, I, don't get me wrong. I, I think from a, a total offensive output, I think the Dodgers peak is higher than the Yankees peak. You didn't even say Will Smith's name. Yeah. Will Smith might yeah. be the best offensive catcher in the game. Um, so, yeah, I, I, they, they have a ton. Uh, I also think, you know, you watch what they did to the Mets and they will also they will just take tough at bat after tough at bat, they will grind you down. Um, and the Yankees don't have that as much. They're a little more swing and miss. Yeah. So yeah, Did you see the, I was watching it live. Did you see the Kike interview where they're like, what's the difference with this team? Oh, uh, and he's like, are we live? And then he said, fuck or whatever. Yeah. He said, yeah. uh, we don't give a fuck. Yeah. Uh, which is, I think one of the dumbest fucking answers I've heard yeah. in a post game, uh, interview. Like, I, he's, I, I think he's trying to say that we're, we're calm, we're under control. Um, but saying we don't give a fuck is, yeah. uh, pretty stupid, but I thought it was badass. I also don't expect high IQ, uh, interviews from any of these guys, let alone the moment after they've won, uh, yeah. A, yeah. A, a championship game. So, yeah, I, I liked him. Asking if it was live, looking around, and then cursing on live TV. That that is just that's classic right there. Um that's fair. But I'm I'm sure uh some kids learned a new word that night. Um okay. One other factor yeah. we're not talking about, Nathan, <laughs> is the Tommy Edmund factor. NL Cleanup CS, hitter. MVP. What did he rack up? Was it four or five, six RBIs in that clinching game batting fourth? Um, playing shortstop. We know that he plays a little bit of center field too. Um, how you doing? <laughs> I mean, it's laughable at this point. Uh, <laughs> 2023, you get a Dallas Garcia, 2020, you get Randy Rosarina, uh, in, you know, in the last five playoff years, there's been three AL or NLCS winners who were just traded by the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. incredible. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm happy for Tommy Edmond, and I still think. Uh, I guess if Fetty like completely shits the bed in 25, then we could look back at this trade and say it was bad. But I, I still like the trade. I still think it it made sense. Um, you know, obviously the Tommy Pham side of it didn't really work, but that I think yeah. he was a throw in. It was Tommy Edmond for for Eric Fetty, and and we don't know what Eric Fetty's going to be like yet, so we won't really be able to evaluate this trade until um, a year from now. But honestly, maybe not. Even, maybe Eric Fetty gets traded yeah. at the deadline and, or or before the deadline, and yeah, maybe it could be like Jordan Montgomery. We acquired him at the midseason and and trade him at midseason. You know. It's going to have a long tail to it. Um, yeah. So I'm not really interested in relitigating the the trade. I'm just, I'm excited for Tommy Edmond. You know, it's fun. He, he's having yeah. a great time. What a, what an outcome. You know, you get traded, you're hurt. You don't know how it's going to go. You're joining this incredible team. We just listed all of the stars and we didn't say Tommy Edmond, but he hit cleanup for them in the clinching game and crushed it. He had what is like 11 hits in this series and, yeah. and kind of ran away with the MVP despite all of those uh, accolades. I saw Otani is something like 18 for his last 22. He hit like 800 yeah. in the series or he's hitting, maybe it's 800 with runners in scoring position in the it, playoffs. It is that. It's, it's like I, he might not have a hit or only has like one or two hits with player with runners not on base. And then when the, on base, it's through the roof. Yeah, I think it's it's. 18 for 22 with runners yeah. in scoring position in the yeah. playoffs and still Tommy Edmond wins the, the MVP. So yeah. I'm happy for him. He, he was, uh, he did a good post game interview. He was talking about his time with the Cardinals and, and like still repping the Cardinals, which we love to see. He doesn't have to do that at all, but we you still love to see it. I want to do it. I'd be like, screw him. I'm going to the world <laughs> series, baby. 
<laughs> so I'm happy for him. Um, yeah. but it is, I mean, it's hilarious. Like it, like, of course he fucking wins the yeah. NLCS MVP. Of course he's going off for the Dodgers. Of course, Jack <laughs> Flaherty is their day one starter for the, for the world series. I know, you know, we were talking about Cardinals, uh, uh former Cardinals on team, uh, playoff teams last week. And I totally spaced that Jack Flaherty is like the number one starter for the Dodgers yeah. right now. Yeah. Game um, one starter, Garrett Cole versus yeah. Jack Flaherty. Are all the players who are not on the Cardinals that are former Cardinals, are that a better team than the current St. Louis Cardinals right now? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> if you build a team out of Flaherty and Waka and, and Weaver and Edmund and Rosarena and Dolis Garcia, Lane Thomas, all these guys. Uh huh. I think the only position you might not have is catcher uh, that would be like a plus player, but Carson Kelly could get the job done. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Uh, It'd be close. That's fun least. to think about. It'd be close at least. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I guess go Yankees. Honestly, I don't want uh, the Yankees to win. I don't want them to be able to say 28. Um, so I, I think I think the Yankees are going to win, but I'll be, I guess, a low key pulling for the Dodgers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot of sugar on why this is a great matchup and everything, but ultimately I hate it. I don't want either of these teams to win. There's a lot of players that I like, and I'll be happy for them, um, particularly Edmund and Flaherty, like you said. But, like, it's it's a bummer for anyone who wanted, like, you always want at least, like, an underdog. There's no underdog in this. Oh, I was pulling for the Guardians or the Mets so hard. I just wanted it so bad. Yeah, I so I know. I put the Mets in the same camp. I was equally unhappy for the Mets, but that's also a little bit just biased Cardinal like yeah. element of it. They are I mean, well. They're another three, four of the three of the four uh, CS teams are the three three hundred million dollar teams, right? If that made sense. Yeah. Um, so this is a year where money what money wins. Now, the Dodgers and the Mets and the Yankees have also built a good organization around it. They're not just buying their stars, but they certainly are, are, have bought a handful of them and, yeah. uh, and it's working very well for them. Yeah. I mean, Giancarlo Stanton, Aaron judge, Garrett Cole, Carlos Rondon, those guys alone are most teams payroll. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or not most team, but a good chunk of teams payroll. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Uh, shall we move on to a little bit of league news? Yes. All right. Uh, White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf is reportedly talking about selling the team. Huzzah, yes. Nathan. Huzzah. Please. I, I'll tell you what, Nate. I am. I am. I'm with this news. I'm feeling that the White Sox might become the Nashville White Sox or the Nashville uh, uh, guitars or, or, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're going to call them. The Nashville uh, harmonicas. <laughs> we the got old the mouth organs down here. What about the Nashville Dolly Partons? Is that good? <laughs> Just name it after yeah, her. I, I mean, she's a national hero, so why not? Um, but uh, that's my prediction. I hope that he sells it. I do think that he is one of the bad owners. I think that he is. I think he loves the game. I think he's just too stupid. Yeah. And I would much rather him move the team than try to ask um, the city of Chicago for $3 billion or whatever he's asking for to build a stadium uh, outside of the community that he has normally been in or the South Side community that he has been in. Um, I just that that is not what it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but that's my prediction. Yeah. How that's going to go down. I mean, I like, I'm definitely pro, uh, Tennessee getting a team Nashville. Yeah. It's obviously been talked a lot about just down I, the road from you. Yeah. It would be fun. I would, um, obviously I would still support the Cardinals and all that, but it would be really fun to have another, uh, major league team, you know, nearby. Um, I don't know. I'd be surprised if they move out of Chicago. Chicago is a big enough market that they can support two teams. And uh, this sort well, of like north side, south side rivalry is kind of fun. I think they can support two teams, but I don't think Chicago's going to want to build a stadium for them. And I think Nashville does. Yeah. I think that's what it comes down to. Could be. There have been some renderings going around of some proposed new uh, Cubs or uh, White Sox stadiums that I think would be pretty beautiful, um, moving it a little bit. Uh, Closer to the city, aim, like I saw one where they have it actually like spun around. So it, so the view is showing like downtown Chicago, which is beautiful. Yeah. You know, there's some cool things they could I do, mean, but I was at the White Sox stadium this year. It's not great, but it's not bad. Yeah. Um, and Reinsdorf isn't doing that thing that we want 88 year old owners to do where he's just like, 
spend it all. Let's go. He's he's yeah running his team into the ground. I mean, he's responsible for the worst team in the history of baseball. <laughs> yes. So he's doing yeah. the opposite of the Mike Illich thing. Um, well, and, uh, it, I mean, there's going to be some decisions on this coming up soon because Manfred has said that expansion is the priority uh, number one after the athletics situation is resolved. Yeah. And while the athletic situation is obviously still uh, pretty shitty, it is not that far away from being resolved, I think. Right. Um, yeah. There is the new wrinkle of what the hell is going to happen with the Rays. Um, so there, there's some of that. Some people have been people have been calling for the Rays to move also for a long time. But neither of those actually accomplish expansion. That's just no. moving teams. MLB clearly wants to move to 32 teams. Yeah. And so I could also see where they're not going to move the White Sox because they want to do a fresh team in Nashville or something like that. But I think there's enough cities to go around for these teams if they really wanted to do it that way. Um, but I, I'd still be pretty surprised if they move out of Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, all right. Moving on. Uh, Fernando Valenzuela, Valenzuela passes away on Tuesday uh, in his 60s. Um, obviously, baseball legend, royalty. Yeah. Um, one of the most important baseball players of the eighties. Um, and yeah, just sad that yeah. it happened so soon. Um, I have Fernando mania, mania, <laughs> mania, mania, Fernando, Fernando mania. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that for, he was, he was the man. Yeah. Yeah. He was awesome. I don't really have a lot to add to it other, uh, no. either, but yeah, good to call. Uh, it. sad day. Shohei Otani's 50, 50 ball has been sold. Nathan. For three point six million dollars, it's quite the payday. Wow! You know we've had this conversation several times about oh I'd give the ball back, I'd give the ball back, or I'd keep it, or whatever. The more I see these dollar amounts, not a chance hell in hell. No. Honestly, I am th- I am elbowing, shoving. I'm getting bloody for these things. Yeah, that is an enormous amount of money for the for the yeah. happens happenstance of being the person who caught the ball. Holy cow. 3.6 million. It sold. I believe it sold this morning. Yeah. Uh, or, or late last night, but, uh, yeah, good for that guy. Um, good for the guy that bought it. I guess the fact that you can drop 3.6 million on a ba- baseball, but, uh, yeah, good for everyone all around. There's so much money out there. That's Nathan, I was say, I have there's part so of me. Little. Is it good for any of them? I mean, it's good I for the know. recipient that yeah. he got some, some, you know, horribly, immorally rich person was able to oh, let me let me splash 3.6 million for a little ball yeah um i could i i'm i'm ooh, i'm getting up on my soapbox right now but Uh-oh. uh so i there's some some underlying issues here but hooray for the guy who um got some pocket change from this billionaire probably for uh for a cool ball do you think uh, you think Ipe was the high bidder on it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> He's gotta <laughs> gotta get out of the debt. Yeah. He's probably uh, all right. probably racked up a ton of uh gambling debt to to buy the to buy the ball. <laughs> it's gonna show up with his legs broken before he goes to prison. Uh, all right, that's all I got for league news, Nady. All right. Well, it's funny you uh you added that as a last note because I'm using the uh the Otani sale as sort of the core of a game we're playing this week. Wow. It got me thinking about famous sports memorabilia and how much they go for. Okay. <laughs> so we're playing a game I'm calling Famous Balls. So here's the way this game works. Dumbass. <laughs> what? No, it's good. I like this. Thank this you. is my favorite game name. Name game? Game of names that you've done so far. So... The Otani ball sold for three point six million. Yeah, I'm going to tell you as reported by Talking About Birds. Right, as reported by, we scooped that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you a piece of famous baseball memorabilia. Okay, and you tell me did it sell for more or less okay. than Otani's ball? Oh shit! Okay, okay, okay. Is this is this inflation adjusted or is this just straight up? Just straight up. Okay. Okay. Bring it. So I got most of these 
from a website called highlandmint.com. I have no idea. It, it kind of felt a little like a fully AI generated website. It may yeah. or may not be, uh, but I want to cite my sources here. So, uh, all right. Babe Ruth's 1920 New York Yankees jersey wow. sold in 2019. Oh, okay. Did that sell for above or below three point six million dollars? Was it was it used? Was it it was his jersey? It was, he wore? it was an authentic. It was one of his jerseys from nineteen twenty, which I believe was the year he was traded. It was his first year with the Yankees. Yeah. So there's the rarity factor. There's the old factor. There's the Babe Ruth factor. Like how many jerseys did he even wear that year? Mm-hmm. I could see it being like ten. You know, because it was or even less. So the rarity is high. It's actually used by him, which is a huge, huge deal. Um, I'm going to go above. I think that's 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 a lot of cash right there. You are correct. It sold for five point six million dollars. Wow, these baseball nerds got some yeah. cash. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mickey Mantle's 1952 Tops rookie card was sold in 2022. Okay. This rookie card was rated as mint. It had a 9.5 yeah. out of 10, which is virtually unheard of for these this, you know, era of baseball cards. Um and if you're not familiar, the 1952 Tops series is a very famous one. It's kind of regarded as the first first year of like real baseball cards um that were like made as a an yeah. item. Obviously, baseball cards have been around for like 40, 50 years before that, but um very different. As we know them. Yeah, very, very different. Um my uh, and I I don't really know this, but my gut instinct is, and I'm fully just guessing, is that physical memorabilia like balls and bats and, and jerseys and, and those kinds of things are going to go for more than cards, even though cards obviously go for very high rate. But I don't think that card is going to break the 3.6 million barrier, even though it is what it is. Um, even though it's Mickey Mantle. Um, I, I, my gut is telling me it's underneath 3.6 million. Well, your gut is wrong. Hambone. Astonishingly. Wow. $12.6 million. Oh my goodness. What? <laughs> I checked multiple sources on this one because I just wanted to really make sure. Um, yeah. $12.6 million. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get mad? They got screwed. They got screwed. I'm, I don't care. You remember, uh, now most of this happened a little bit before this, but one of the strange outcomes of the pandemic was this huge surge on collectibles. And I think that this obviously benefited from that. Yeah. I, I just, never in a million years no. would I have guessed it. It eclipsed 10 million. Never in 12.6 million 6. years would I have guessed. Uh, wild. Sidebar, did you, you may or may not have seen this. Um, so going back to that, the the like crazy surge in, in collectibles, there's a company now facing severe litigation um, because uh, it has been basically discovered that it was really this one small company of a small amount of people that basically manufactured that surge in collectible uh, valuation. They were buying everything off the market and reposting it at higher and higher and higher dollar amounts to uh, basically control the market. And and this was centered around things like Pokemon cards and baseball <laughs> cards and things like that. And it culminated in that copy of, uh, uh, I think it was a copy of Mario 64 that sold for like, Thirteen million dollars or something like it was. It wasn't that much, but it was a yeah. lot of money. Um, and and now this company is facing like heavy penalty for market manipulation and and stuff like that. I I hate our world. <laughs> yeah, it's super fucked, right? It sucks. Yeah. Also, that being said, like if you're gonna pay that much money for a copy of a video game or a baseball card, like I don't know. Also, fuck you. I don't really care. Well, it there's a high level amount where you're like, well, whatever. It's all just yeah. stupid rich people just you know money laundering most of the time. Um, but uh, it does trickle down right. uh, in impact, just like standard collectors or enthusiasts who like want to buy a copy of Mario 64 uh to play and now oh. the sure the 
mint packaged one because it sold for two million. Now, just like a shitty cartridge in a box is going to be like ninety eight dollars or something. You know, really, yeah, really stupid. That sucks. Yeah. Um, anyway, Mark McGuire's seventieth home run ball. Yeah, this is a famous one. Yeah, I remember this one. I do too. Nineteen ninety nine is when it sold. My guess is since it was it was record setting, but it wasn't record breaking. My mm-hmm. guess is it was not as high as the record breaking home run. Um, and the year, uh, you know, all of that kind of taken into consideration. I'm going to say it's under three point six million dollars. That is correct. It was a cool three million dollars, which Damn, in 1999, holy shit, yeah, with a, that adjust- is way more than I would have guessed. I know, uh, infl- inflation adjusted. Um, certainly that's more than 3.6 at this yeah. point. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Good for that guy. Yeah. Um, I think this is the one where, um, the guy who caught it, the Cardinals offered him like season tickets, bats, yeah, yeah. sign ball, stuff like that. And the guy just wanted to meet Mark McGuire and Mark McGuire turned it down, said no. And so he took it to market and sold it for $3 million. Good on him. <laughs> yeah. Smart move. Yeah. But also like, really, Mark, you wouldn't just meet the guy, but maybe Mark knew, maybe he was like, this guy's going to be set up on this. Probably not. That's probably He's not. probably just like, I don't want to talk to a normie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's a, uh, here's a fun one. Babe Ruth's Uh-oh. 1927 World Series ring. Wow. Okay. I, I'm going to just based it above. No. In, what? In 2017, it sold for $2.09 wow. million. Wow. I should have picked that one up. That's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. <I'm just> like, <laughs> oh, have we mentioned we are billionaires? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I was really surprised Damn. because so in 2019, his jersey sold for five and a half or almost six right. million dollars no five and a half million dollars and then but only two years before his world series ring yeah sold for 2.9 huh. 2. i mean there's, that, that's one of one which is why i was like yeah. of course yeah that's i would have thought so too huh. yeah all right all right going back to baseball cards honus wagner Oh yeah, the famous. It's a uh, yeah. Um, it's listed as a Honus Wagner T two zero six baseball yeah. card. This is from like, if you know anything about baseball cards, um, you know these are considered the most rare. Honus Wagner uh, did not want to be a part of this because they were sold with cigarettes, and he was not. Uh, he did not want his brand, his name affiliated with cigarettes. Um, but some were still sold. There's only like. 60 of them known in in baseball and the most of them are like they're like this is like hand painted baseball cards right. days you know um but yeah one of them sold in 2022 so you might remember this yeah i, I believe i do and i believe it eclipsed 3.6 million it did 7.25 million dollars wowie zowie yeah love to find me one of those yeah i know right I, that's I like sell that shit in a heartbeat. oh my god <laughs> immediately um there, because yeah, wasn't there a story of like a um, a nun found yeah. one in an attic or something like yeah, that? I yeah, I don't know if it was this one or a uh, a different one, but there yeah. was um, like a uh, they were cleaning out um, yeah. a, a house or like a, a church or something, and they found a box of cards, and and one of these was in it, which is like always the dream for anyone who's into like oh, estate man. sales or anything like that. Hell yeah. It's like made me want to get into estate sales, these sorts of things where like finding old video games or old baseball cards or something like that. Yeah. I think that would fit your personality. Just <laughs> rummaging, rummaging through other people's stuff yeah. and undercutting them for it. Oh my God. It's Pokemon snap. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, all right. Here's a fun one. Jackie Robinson's 1947 Jersey. So Jersey. rookie year. Yeah, I don't know how many jerseys he had. Assumingly, more than one, but probably yeah. not that many. Right. Uh, so, a Jackie Robinson uh, jersey sold in 2017. <sighs> um, I I mean, it's hard to imagine it going for less. So, I, I'm going to say above 2.05 million dollars wow. in 2017. That's another one. I should have picked that up. That's a screaming deal. 
Yeah, I, I bet I, you that's I, worth like twice right now. There's there is, seems to be zero like rhyme. Well, it reason. just takes one or two guys who just yeah. really want the thing. Right? I, I imagine the buyer's market is incredibly thin for these sorts of things, and you're just yeah. hoping that one of the one of the insane rich people that have a personal collection want right. one of these things. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Last one. Hank Aaron's 750th, 755th home run baseball. Um, very, very famous. Now this sold in 1996. 96. Um, just because of the year, I, I have to go under, uh, cause that would be incredible if it sold for over 3.6 million. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was 99 when the McGuire ball sold for 3 million, but yes, yeah. this, this sold lower. Um, it sold for $650,000. I, um, I bet that is worth quite I, a bit more right now. I bet it would sell more than the Otani ball. Hank Aaron's I think it would. like legacy has only improved, yeah. like improved and increased and, right. and, and all that. So, wow. <sighs> Someday I'm going to become a ball hawk and shove kids <laughs> out of the way. Yeah, I didn't, I, I started doing just when I was setting this up and came up with the name famous balls. Um, I was just doing, uh, home run balls or, or famous caught balls. Cause Otani's yeah. is, um, the, the highest selling, um, but it's almost exclusively just like a bunch of Barry Bond stuff, which is right, fine, yeah. but it's just not particularly interesting. Um, so I thought this other memorabilia was a little more fun. I think you did a really great job, Nate. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's money in these balls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it, I, I guess I could catch an Otani ball at Coors Field. Yeah. I'll yeah. I, I mean, I don't, are there any other, is there, I guess judge if he does it again, I could see like a six, a 60, you know, like a 62, 63. I could see those being pretty valuable, but he's already done it. So it's going to be less valuable. Um, no one really saw a 50, 50 season coming. Right. Um, I don't know. I guess if judge hits like 80 home runs or something, um, but yeah, I, I think it'll, it'll be more like counting stat, like legacy numbers going forward. I yeah. can't think of a player who right now who could really outpace those numbers. Yeah. And I, obviously uh, the 50th home run ball, the only 50, 50 season is yeah. pretty massive, but it's also Otani. So yes. this the is the biggest huge, celebrity in baseball. Yeah. yeah. There's now, and it was like, he went six for six that day. Uh, it Three was just like, yeah, yeah, just an unbelievable performance. So yeah. everybody and, and the Otani factor just alone. Yeah. 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 I imagine there will eventually be some Juan Soto, uh, yeah. balls that will be pretty valuable. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it. Um, thanks everyone for listening as always. We appreciate it. Tell your friends, uh, our next episode will be coming out on Halloween. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I like to do an evil laugh. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> wait for more next week. Yeah, leave me out of it, dude. <laughs> Too spooky. <laughs> no, 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 no. Too spooky for me. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, you just want women covered in blood. That is not what I That's said. What that is said. so out of context. <laughs> <laughs> Roll the tape back. Uh, all right. Patreon.com slash talking about birds. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, until next week, <laughs> um, go Tommy Ed. Yeah, I guess Luke Weaver, go get him. <laughs>